Welcome back to another episode of Born Again Bow Hunting Podcast. This will be a kickoff to the trail camera series we got going on here. And tonight we are joined with Cody. So, Cody, why don't you give us a little bit of a description about yourself? You've been on our podcast before, but uh, well, I'm sure we've had some new listeners since then. All right. Well, appreciate you guys having me on. You guys know I love trail cams, and um, every year I, I do. I normally step it up. Like I'm going to get five, or I'm going to get six more, and then <laughs> it just keeps piling on to where um, I had a, a guy posted a whole bunch for sale, like. I, I looked at my wife. I said, "This guy's got 20. And she, was like, she was like, "I'm like, I'm like, well, she, I was like, I'm gonna see if he'll split them up, but he didn't want to split them up. But I was like, all right, I'm gonna buy these six because they were a certain type, you know. Yeah. I was like, I want these, and he's like, I don't want to split them up. I'm like, okay, well, I don't want all 20 because I'm that would be the max. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't think I could utilize them. But I had two last year that I never took out of the box and used. They just were staged up, you know, extras. Uh, yeah. But my, yeah, my name's Cody Jenkins. Um, I'm a father, a husband. I got four kids. I got three boys and a girl. My uh, girls just turned 11 months. I got a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old, almost eight. Um, so that's my main gig. I work for the railroad full time. I also run a podcast on the side called White Tail Legacy, um, as well as as a uh, bunch of other side gigs i have <laughs> i uh, i like to make about 10 to twelve thousand dollars on the side a year you know? yeah. <laughs> yep. you know, doing whatever this guy needs help pouring concrete i did that in a past life i <laughs> did construction in a past life you know so i'm always into um i rent trailers out as dumpsters um i got a lot of stuff i do on the side to um, before I had kids, I did much more of that, but now I'm kind of roping her back in because yeah. I don't have now you're as a, much time. Now you're a soccer coach and a football <laughs> yeah, coach. Yeah, I'm a soccer coach, <laughs> uh, football coach. We know those coach. pay very well. Those pay <laughs> yeah, very, those very well. Those volunteer jobs. Yeah. yeah they, Excellent play. I uh, just want to say uh, coach football last year, won the league championship. Um, there you go. Yeah, and, Big payday. Uh, yeah, I had, <laughs> Big uh, payday. I had two – I had two second graders on my team as first and second grade flag, so it's pretty serious, you know. <laughs> um, I had two second graders on the roster, and that was it. We won. Um, I won. I played every single kid on the team in the championship game and uh, just had my first soccer game yesterday or Sunday. Uh, won 17 to 0. Oh, wow. I felt, no I felt mercy. Bad. I felt. Yeah. I, I was going to say, like, is there not a mercy rule? You no, know, I had. A, <laughs> I have my kid, one my young, my middle boys in preschool, and this is first and second grade soccer. Um, but I said, instead of doing the two different soccer games, I'll just move him up. So I played two preschoolers and three first graders. So I, my, my, <laughs> my, nephew, my nephew's them? a preschooler, um, <laughs> as well. So I have two preschoolers going against first and second graders out there. Um, it just, um, I have a, my saying is try hard, can't lose. Um, and I try to instill that in my kids and it was, they they won seventeen to zero, and then they they said can't lose the loudest <laughs> every every field heard from ever. I'm like, oh man, you know, that, was kinda, that was a little rough this time. Guys. Oh man, you, need to, you gotta add and stay humble at the end of that saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, uh, try hard, yeah. can't lose, stay humble. Yeah, there you go. Oh yeah. my, yeah. I'm hoping I'm hoping the next game is uh, a little bit different, but. That uh, in a nutshell, that's me. I try to be what a savage. Um, <laughs> yeah, I try to be as best as you can be. Um, but uh, my uh, a quote from Gary V that I love it says that um, I want to have the tallest skyscraper. You know, I want I want to have the best podcast. I want to have the best show. Um, but I want to do it by building up people around me, build myself taller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's why I appreciate you having me on and the love that you guys have showed, you know, throughout the last couple of years of really growing our friendship. Um, you know, I want to see you guys succeed as bad as I want to succeed. And I try to instill that in my kids. I said, if you do good, your teammates going to want to do better. Next teammates going to want to do better. And uh, just for any dads out there or becoming dads, don't hold your kids back. It's unbelievable what a seven or eight year old kid will do. Um, my seven-year-old just ran two and a half miles with me the other night. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's I cool. was just, yeah, we normally go for like mile, mile, 
And he's like, let's go further. And I was like, all right, let's see. Let's see what you got, you know? Yeah. And uh, we were at the two and a half mile mark. And I was like, I, we're done, dude. He was hitting a gritty on the way back home. I seen that. I'm that like, was funny. <laughs> I'm like, this kid is a war out. <laughs> That's so uh, funny. Yeah, I talked to my wife. I'm like, um, you know, I it. you just put these limitations in your mind on yourself as well as other people or kids. And there's really no limitations. It's just whatever the kid is. You know, and, and it, my kid blew me away. I was humbled by him. I'm like, he's mm-hmm. way stronger and more passionate about it. He didn't want to quit because I kept going just straight up. Yeah. You know, he wanted to beat me at seven years old. There so. you go. Wow. So what's he training for? Like soccer? 17 uh, no, to nothing, he, man. Yeah, there, is a, <laughs> there is a race on 4th of July. Um, it's six to 10. Um, it's one mile race. Last year, he got he went into it as a six-year-old and won. Um, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, he was, yeah, first place. And what was really bad was he was way out ahead. And I had some buddies that had their 10 year old sons in there. And I told them, I said, you're going to have to run. Like, there's 10 year olds in here. And these, uh, these guys play sports. Yeah. He was probably 60, 70 yards in front of him. And he started walking. <laughs> oh, at no. The end, and I was like, you got to keep running. He's like, they're way behind me, guys. I'm like, dude, you got to. <laughs> Finish the race. Like, come on. What is this? Walks across the finish line. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna can't have stop, no won't stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can't <laughs> stop, won't stop. Uh, but, Dude, yeah, I, I love I, it. Uh, I love it. Yeah, I bred it. I bred it into him to just be the absolute <laughs> best he can be. And um, he he does not want to let me down at all. Which That's awesome. I, I tell him, there's no way. I said, if you try your hardest, you always win, man. Yeah. And that's how I see life, you yeah. know, and, and Good. hunting, man. If you, if you put it all out there and, and hunting and you don't tag a buck or you don't, you know, you miss your shot, dude, you tried your best. That's all you can yeah. do. So. Yeah. 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 But I like that a lot. Well, I like the way that you build up your kids and, and your friends and stuff like that too. I mean, that means a lot and that goes a long ways too. That's cool. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's a little bit about me in a long ways. Um, very passionate dad, very passionate hunter. Love running trail cams, run a podcast on the side for the last five years, and uh, been married for nine years. And, uh, man, that's the best thing that ever happened to me, get a wife and get some kids and really make me want to put a lot of effort in myself as well as the kids to start thinking about longevity, Mm -hmm. make sure I'm around. Yeah. And I don't, want, I don't want my kid to be able to beat me when he's 14. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's the motivation. Right yeah, there. for sure. Yeah, 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 sure. yeah. I'm like, he's a savage. He's seven years old. I'm like, I got to step up my game. He's going to be smoking <laughs> at 14, 12. Seven years is a long time to get better. So yeah, that's yeah. scary for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we don't really need any icebreakers now that we've, you yeah. know, we're pretty comfortable with Cody and he's comfortable being on a podcast. But why don't you just because of what we do, let's get to our icebreakers, Kev, yep. and then we'll get into um, how many cameras you run, Cody, and, and we'll go from there. Go from there. Yeah. Okay. So um, during hunting season, like what's your go to drink, energy drink, water, coffee, pop, you know, what you stop at a I'm gas an station. Idiot, what's I'm your an go-to? energy drink guy. And I'll tell you yes, what I'm sick of all I, these losers saying coffee, water. <laughs> yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I'm an energy sick drink guy, it. and a lot of people are pretty hardcore on their flavors. I'm like just kidding about calling people for... losers. I'm I'm just joking. I just <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get bored like black coffee. I get bored of it, man. So tell yeah. me about it. Tell me about your energy drink. There's uh, there's a uh, there's like one guy. He's like, I only drink, you know, the bang, the purple bangs, or I only drink the purple monsters. I normally go into Casey's and I'm like, all right, what's two for four? Yeah, <laughs> and then I pick out a flavor that corresponds with the deal that they have, and then I buy two of them. You know, I mean that's that's kind of I, I'm I habita- I gravitate towards orange, purple, uh, pineapple, coconut kind of guy, yeah. that like a fruity guy. Um, but I uh, that's that's what I do. I'm like, oh, okay. Ghost is on sale for two for four. I'll okay. get that. Rock Somebody said, sale. "Have you had the Swedish fish ghost?" Oh yeah. Do you like it? Oh yeah. Somebody yeah. just somebody oh, yeah. just posted yeah. about that today, so yeah. I got to try I, it. I, and I do all sugar free. I got to do sugar free. Yeah, me too. Um, but anything that's sugar free on sale, I'll try. I've tried about <laughs> everyone. I've tried about everyone that's on there. There's and- a. 
Those yeah. ghost Sour Patch Kid ones. That's yeah. real popular. Those yeah, are really those popular now. <laughs> I have never had those before. I got to try them. Yeah, those are real yeah. popular. I uh, I got into... Uh, I really like the Rockstar Recoveries. That's okay. a good go-to. I like, I like the ones that are like a... Lower in caffeine, like the 120, 180s. Yeah, 150 is uh, good. 300, dude. Are, 300 has got your heart thumping at the yeah, end of it. I'm like, man. yeah, so, they, yeah. Uh, I like I the 150s. One, it's like a, yeah, it's like I got to take two hours to drink. This. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it was definitely. On sale, so. <laughs> <laughs> Need to throw some water in between the sips. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 150 is a sweet spot. I've been doing the yeah. monsters, um, the like the white zero. Those are those have been my yeah. go-to lately. So yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I just I, I basically replace coffee all together with them. I'm, I'm probably gonna die young from it, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I, I whatever. I have yeah. I I diet pretty heavily. I drink a ton of water. I mm-hmm. used to drink a ton of diet Pepsi. I kind of cut that out, but I won't. I can't kick the energy drinks. I drink them. But I'm that guy who's taking an energy drink with me, and then <laughs> I will stand to have a spot to set that on my tree stand seat. And I'll just stand, and so oh, I man. don't. My my <laughs> Dedication love it. out there, man. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> I'm uh, a stand or not a sitter, anyway. So if you if you raise your seat up against the tree and if and you kind of squeeze the can in between the tree and the seat, it's perfect. Perfect, right there. Perfect. Pro, <laughs> yeah. little pro, pro tip. tip. Yeah. Pro tip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. I love it. Good stuff. I just black coffee. Oh, okay. Well, let's move on to the next question. That's <laughs> that's way more fun. That's a way more fun conversation. So, uh, next, so, Gabby. Go so, qu- question number two is: What's your current bow setup? And you can go into a little bit of specs. You know, poundage, draw, kind of your arrow setup too. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm shooting the Matthews V3. Um, I shoot a lighter draw weight than a lot of people. Um, I I'm a bigger guy. I lift weights, but I have the junkest wrist in the game. I've broken <laughs> my right wrist twice, my left wrist three times, and my oh right my arm gosh. twice when I was wow. a kid. Oh my gosh! Um, yeah, I was I was extremely malnourished when I was young, wow. and uh, my bones didn't develop very well. And I actually broke the growth plate in my right elbow too. Playing like that was my worst pain ever. I threw a football, and my gun or my arm cocked like a shotgun. And uh, broke that growth ring in there. Had to do physical therapy oh, on it. Oh, wow. wow! So I have a bad, I have a weak elbow, and my right wrist is still like it. It hurts every day. Like in the morning, wow. I gotta like warm it up. Um, so I shoot <laughs> sixty five pounds. Um, That's I fine. feel comfortable. Yeah, still, with that. Don't. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of guys that shoot heavier, but um, I like the draw cycle. Shoot sixty five pounds. I. One thing that I do that is a little different than a lot of guys, I like a slider sight, but I don't like a single pin sight, yeah. but I don't like four pins. So yeah. I buy a four pin sight and I rip out one of the, 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 the fourth, the fourth pin. Yeah. I take a fourth pin out. I like a three pin slider, um, to open up the side picture, mm-hmm. um, uh, quite a bit, um, I don't like vertical sight pins. I like horizontal sight pins as well. I've tried the, yeah. you know, the, the back method. I don't really like yeah. that. Um, and I'm shooting the Exodus MMT arrows, um, and uh, they're they're building for me. I shot 350 spine for a while, and then I switched to 300, and they seem to shoot a little better yeah. um, mm-hmm. out of my bow. Yeah, it's Matthews um, like a stuff for arrow. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So um, switching that up, but you know, pretty. Three years ago, I finally came off the whisker biscuit. Um, I was on, I was on there pretty hard. <laughs> I finally came off that and started shooting a drop away. And uh, I'm a four quiver arrow guy. I like everything to be kind of small and compact. Mm-hmm. Four um, arrows and a quiver. Yeah. Four, <laughs> they said four quivers. What did you say? Did you say four, four quivers. Yeah. Oh yeah. He yeah. likes four quivers on his ball. Four He's got 12, he's got 16 arrows on his back. Hey, just in case, you never never know, yeah? yeah? You never never know. know. He has a hip quiver Um, when he goes in the woods along with his, yeah, anyways, I'm just joking. Go ahead. Yeah, that's my bow setup. Uh, Cool. I I am a really, I don't like to change my stuff very much. I kind of like to, Mm -hmm. so I I shot a Matthews mission before that a long time um, and, and loved it. And uh, I, when I stepped my bow up, I was like, wow, this, I shoot a lot better. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's wow. crazy. 
what <laughs> it's a big what, difference six, seven years of technology yeah. do, you know yeah, yeah. that's a big jump and uh yeah now i i've uh i've got a lot of kills with it you know so i'm feeling more comfortable and mm-hmm. um that's one thing i'm like man it works i'm comfortable i've killed a lot of stuff i have that self-confidence with it um that's something i didn't have with that bow but then the first year i had it, i killed two bucks in october you know so it was it ended up being a pretty good year cool. yeah i'd cool. say so yeah did i ever send you those side plates or did i never send you those side plates cody because you're a lefty uh, right yeah i'm a lefty yeah i, I don't think, think i sent I, you those i'll send yeah. you those i forgot to make those for you yeah i use the old <laughs> hockey tape yeah uh, every bow manufacturer likes to make their grip for grandma hands for some reason i don't understand why <laughs> me yeah, yeah uh, me either that's why i made the side factory plates. grips are yeah this, they're just yeah i don't like them yeah i like to beef it up a little bit um and i also like to elongate the top you know so mm-hmm. i have like a I, a shelf because you, know, you have you have the shelf but when you put that grip on there the shelf's kind of gone so yep. i heavy wrap the top and then kind of thread mm-hmm. it out going down and he needs my side um, plates then yep yeah i'll hook you up i'll to, hook you up to get that shelf but i have never been like an incredibly accurate bow shooter but i've been able to get it done mm-hmm. every you know that's yeah. that's kind of my style i i enjoy shooting um but the more kids i have the less i shoot the more they shoot it yeah, seems yeah. like <clears throat> yeah, so. yeah. but i did insanely i i bought my kid a crossbow this year wow the learning curve on those things <laughs> i've never shot one before it's zero it was crazy i got it out two of the shots box standing yeah, out of the box, standing thirty yards, first shot, just right in there. Yeah. I'm like, I ain't got to sight this thing in. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, it was awesome, man. Next but year, yeah, Cody's my, like, I'm taking it out. <laughs> no, no, yeah, my boy's gonna take it out, and I'm I'm doing every means possible to, you know, we got literally everything that you can get to be able to hunt every season to hopefully have him be successful mm-hmm. i really want to see him shoot like a basket six or something yeah yeah that'd be awesome be so jacked you know absolutely yeah yeah and then uh the final question will lead in kind of to the podcast is what's your favorite trail camera that you're running right now um uh, my favorite trail camera is the lift two um by exodus it's no longer made um i really like the trek it's also no longer made but the lift two is my go-to video on a scrape um cam it has a viewing screen uh and the video quality is really really good Mm -hmm. the audio the audio on the video is insane like you can hear them raking you can hear them snort wheezing and raking the brush and on, on a scrape and um, you can hear like birds in the background and yeah. it, it's crazy what, what you can do with those cameras, but they supposedly have a new one coming out. That's going to be better video quality, um, this year, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been the lift two for ever since I got them. Let's see, we have five, five and a half years ago. Oh, that's wow. been my damn yeah. before that, before that, I really, really liked um just as like a standard running cam before i went to exodus i really liked the brownings i had a lot of good yep. success with it yep. and i was extremely rough on those cameras and they held up pretty dang good we actually had i actually had one that didn't work and uh i was with a hunting buddy and i was like I'm going to pitch this thing in the back of the truck, drive to the next location, and when I get out, it's going to work. And it did. I threw <laughs> that thing in the back of the truck. It rattled around on the way to the other spot. I turned it on. I'm like, see? Well, never let me down. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's classic. Yeah. Classic. Classic. That's the secret. They actually, whenever a camera breaks, they just they all do that. Yeah, just they, they, yeah, they all do that. Yeah, that's the secret. Back, they just put it in a washing machine and let it pour out a little bit. <laughs> or the dryer, no. I guess. The washing machine would be too rough. Throw it yeah. in a dryer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, solid. So going into the podcast, so actually we're for the for the listeners and, and us again, we're we're filming this or excuse me, we're we're recording this uh what is what is today? May? No, uh, no April. No. April 26th. end of April, but this podcast is gonna air um in the summer. So right now you guys should be antsy to get cameras in. We're trying to figure out it's summertime, velvets on the bucks, like you know, we're we're trying to figure stuff out. So we're gonna get into all the ends and, and needs that we need to talk about for trail cameras. Mm-hmm. And to start, Cody, to start that off, 
how many cameras are you running um, non-sell and sell a year? Okay, so I, I went out there um, today and counted um, when I got the show notes. I have 36 right now, nine are cellular. Um, <laughs> I did, I, I am going to get another three non-sell and three cellular. Mm-hmm. So I have 36 now. I'll have another six. So I'll be up to 42 if I don't buy any. And then two of them are in package still. So if I get those out, um, maybe, maybe not. But I'll be right at 42 cams after the June of this year. That's a healthy number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, real, that's a healthy uh, herd. That's a real healthy. <laughs> that's a real healthy number. Yeah. It, it's, bro, it's just the, uh, you know, accumulation of... Uh, you know, running the podcast for five years, working with the company for so long. Mm -hmm. And then also, oh, there's a can, there's a sell on cams. I'm going to snag two. Or there's, you know, here's a bunch of reg SD card cams. I'm going to snag three of them where you go into Dunham's and you're looking for 270 bullets, but they got, you know, cams for 28 bucks. You're like, ah, I can't I'm pass that three. up. You know, yeah. I got, <laughs> it's year after year of that. Um, yep. And what, what's insane is when my co-host and me split, I lost like 20 cams as well. Wow. So, so you um, actually had significantly more. Yeah. And I, and I, I bought, since I lost those 20, I bought quite a few last year. Um, and I gained a few last year. Um, but like I said, I, I always lose three, four, five a year as well. So just from I theft. Yeah. From theft. Jeez. Um, which I have a method that I'll mention on here that I'm going to start doing that will hopefully eliminate that. Um, mm -hmm. I've came up with something that is, um, very, very solid and very cheap. Yep. Um, I try to break it a couple times and, uh, it, it's holding up pretty good, but we can get into that and in some trail camera tips, but yeah, that's the number right now. I'll be at 42. Um, if they all turn, they're all working. Um, if they all turn on and, and rip, I'll be at 42 next year. Cool. Nice. So. Cool. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope, no, I was going to say one of, uh, one of the questions that I had that I'm sure a lot of other people are wanting to know is like, what are, what are you doing during the off season for camera care? Are you, are you doing anything? Or are you just throwing them in a box and then just, you know, going with it like that? Um, everything separated from, brand to brand on a shelf. Um, I built some, I built an addition on my house and I had a whole bunch of extra two by tens. <laughs> so I built the biggest, beefiest shelf, the whole trail. <laughs> literally park a truck on this thing. <laughs> and it's out in my studio with, uh, with cams on it. Um, I take every single strap off. I've been running paracord on a lot, but sometimes I run straps. Straps are just a giant mess. Yep, I man. take all of them off, throw them in a box, um, I probably have like 50 or 60 straps just from, you know, over the years of collecting stuff, losing the cam, it stops working. I keep the strap because you mm -hmm. never know. Um, but everything's organized by cam or by brand and then um, by the individual cam type, just so I know, like, I get an email that X cam has a firmware update. I have all, okay, I got five of these, so I can pull out every single one of them and do the firmware update in one day hmm. instead of digging through the pile and then, oh man, I think I had three of them and you're, you're at the bottom of the box or whatever and you had two more down there and then mm -hmm. when you're trying to hang them, they're not working and you're like, this cam's junk, this cam mm -hmm. company's junk, but actually it needs a firmware update. Um, I take out all the batteries, um, they go in the trash automatically um, I normally have just because I've lost so many cams over the years, I normally have four to five extra battery trays per cam. Cause I've realized over the years, a lot of the times a cam, someone thinks the cam's junk and it's actually the battery tray. One of the contacts is rusting. Mm. You lost the contact. Um, you know, the tension on the, the batteries has, you know, you've used it for so long, hot and cold, hot and mm -hmm. cold out there it kind of loses its tension to push against the, the connectors. So I normally have four or five of those per, and the, the camera companies are getting a lot better where one battery tray fits most of their cameras, which is nice. Yeah. Um, there for a while, every 
camera had its own battery tray system um, and it was kind of complex, but that's the main thing I've learned. Get the batteries out of them, get them organized, kind of synchronized. And then it gives me a number um, of what I think. And then it also gives me an idea of these are for X property. These are for Y property. These are for, you know, and then, oh crap, I lost two for property T. I need to get two more to throw in there. Or I want to run another cell on property T. I'm going to throw, I'm going to pull a SD cam card a reg- and then put a cell there. Um, cause the assets are keen when it comes to trail cams, um, and you know, assets per area is the hardest topic for trail cams. In my opinion, knowing how many tools to advocate to one area yeah. to see success, if it's going to work, you know, that's, that's my biggest struggle every single year. And sometimes I go overboard in one spot and then I pull everything. I'm like, well, I had four cams I run all year and I would not hunt any one of those spots any single time of the year. And I ran those cameras there the whole entire year. (laughs) Um, And there were literally nothing on those cams. Mm -hmm. And so I wasted assets all year in four spots. Yeah, Yeah, but I could Um, see that being... It could be easy to for, like even forget that they're there, and then it's a yeah, not a yeah. great spot. And you know, oh, I just left four cameras there all year, and I don't remember. Yeah, I do that quite a bit. Yeah, you do that a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done that before where I've been walking, and I'm like, "Is that my cam?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, I have a numbering system. Um, I I write numbers on them on the outside of them most of the time, um, and then I have two corresponding cards with written numbers on them as well, like. Like right here, here's a a number thirteen for number thirteen, number seven for number seven. Hmm. You know, everything's cool. There's a this one's D. I don't know what that is. I got cam with D on it somewhere. <laughs> I just got a few uh, file of cards here in front of that. But yeah, it's, and then uh, like what I like to do is like these black ones it says E one. That's an Exodus one. So like all the to simplify it, if it's an Exodus cam, I run a black SD card in it. If it's a different cam, I run a silver SD card in it. Mm-hmm. So I know when gotcha. I'm out there, what it came out of. I'm like, I'm like, okay, this is silver. <laughs> it says number 13. I have a pouch with them all numbered. But if I'm looking through it and I'm like, where are these pictures at? Like sometimes you run it so much, you're like, and then I look at it. I'm like, okay, it's not an Exodus cam. What cam is it? number 13 okay then i go there i'm like all right it's this and then it kind of gives me an idea of what i'm actually looking at i think this if is, you run this is the perfect hobby in, for well, i say so this is the perfect hobby for somebody with ocd because like you're yeah, literally yeah. just like everything has its place and it's just cracking everything me up dude it's it's so funny because the you, reason yeah. is is because if i don't do it that way um everybody that knows me i fly by the edge of my seat and just barely Everything's done very good, but just very good by that. Point. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> That's just, all that matters. I'm that I'm that close to disaster and success <laughs> every single time. That's and awesome. I fall on the success side by the grace of God yeah. every single time. But if I don't have this method, yeah, it would be a disaster. And I went out there so many times and pulled cards and had nothing on them because. The you know the card was for the firmware was for a different yeah. card yeah and it got corrupted whatever. Mm, yep. yeah and it when you when you're doing what I'm doing with these cards and you're trying to find the biggest deer in your area to chase this you know it, it's and you got and you drove two hours to get this card yeah. and then it's corrupted like then mm. you're really like I got it I kind of got to get my shit together here. yeah yep. um, so yes like I said I had my co-host homie. He was very good at organizing. Um, that was kind of his strong point. He's very good at technology, very good at organizing his brain and individual. And we kind of came together with this. So we pulled all the cards together. So he would say, hey, I got 13. I'm going to get 13, 15, and 17 cam today. I need the second cards. And I would be able to give him 13, 15, and 17 mm-hmm. so he could switch the cards out. Cause we kind of all did it together, but now I'm, it's all, it's simplified cause I'm doing it by myself, but yeah, that's yeah. how I stay organized. Um, by brand, 
numbered um, pretty well, like as as simple and com- com- complex at the same time <laughs> as it can be. You yeah, know? yeah. And I've noticed too, like uh, you mentioned a little pouch for the SD cards, like not only for trail cameras, but like here for the podcast, for example, for like the mixer and the, the uh, cameras, just keeping the cards organized in one thing is very helpful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they're, they're super cheap anymore. I mean, yeah. a couple bucks and you can store like, I don't know, 15 to 20 cards in this little thing, the size of your wallet or yeah. something like yeah. that. It's super Heck, even handy. like, uh, this is going to sound real, you know, redneck, but if you don't want to go spend the 10 bucks on one of them pouches, I mean, a little, a little sandwich baggie, you know, like mm-hmm. even that'll work where you can, you know, if you keep each sandwich baggie, it's own individual, like, you know, camera brands or whatever, yeah. you know, it's yeah. better than just throwing it in a giant mess. You know what I mean? So yeah, Josh profit, he uses a, like a tackle box, yeah. Like a clear tackle box idea. thing, that small individual. Yeah, I have, uh, smart. I have, I, it's like a Moultrie, it's a Moultrie camera SD, like camera holder. Um, holds, uh, I think it holds 16. And I have like four of those, mm-hmm. you know, and, and everything's divvied out and everything's wrote and it's just felt, but they're real thin, real small. And, uh, you can fit two behind each slot and it's tight. Um, the only thing that's really bad with those of like, it flips upside down in your bag or something. And then you open it up and you're like, okay, now I gotta, <sighs> now I gotta put one back in one and two back in yeah. two. <laughs> and then you're like, what card? The another thing that I do, um, is when, so say I, I have that, that bag, right. And, um, it has, let's say I have one through 16, and I pull six, nine, and fifteen that day. Um, it's really hard to know what you pulled, so all I do is I flip them around backwards and I stick them in like that. Mm-hmm. So okay. when I open the sleeve, everything's facing me. SD card forward, except for what I pulled, it's facing me. SD card back. Smart. I open it up. I'm like, all right. I pulled this can, this can, this can. I pull them out, and then I look verify what I got going on. Yeah. Um, because that was a really big problem. Was like. You get back, you open it up, you're yeah. like, uh, uh, what did I pull? Yeah. What did yeah. I not pull? <laughs> Especially when you have and, that uh, many trail cameras yeah. and that many yeah. cards. Yeah, because yeah, you're you're always going to have one card in the sleeve per the camera. Yeah. Um, and if they're all facing forward, I got back here, I just have to look at every single card until I figured out right. what I checked. You know, right. the, the reverse method is very simple and easy for me to go, go through there and say, okay, this is a six that I checked, um, you know, and, and a lot of these cams, people are wondering how you run them. I don't run them until the end of the year. Like I'm setting these things and sometimes they run for a month and die. Sometimes they run, they be running when I pick them up in February. Like I, I literally picked cams up in March this year, you know, like, um, there's no, once it's hung, it's either going to get stolen or it's going to be there. So getting mm-hmm. the, Getting the data for me right now compared to or in season doesn't really matter on the cams that I'm hanging for long term sets. Makes sense. Yeah, you're wanting yeah. more of that annual data that you can bounce off of for next year. And yeah, um, I'm not only wanting that; I'm wanting to know what caliber of bucks are in the area, yeah. and if any bucks are in the area that I have on other properties. Yeah. Um, that's where, when you can, when you can connect the dots from a buck from property to property within a couple of days on camera that's cool. and kind of see how he was flowing through the rut, that's when stuff <laughs> really can start helping you out. Starts making um, sense. Yeah. Yeah. It starts making sense. So cool. I had one more question yeah. about kind of like organization and stuff, Cody, what kind of batteries are you running? Because I find myself like, I was running uh, the lithiums, Energizer lithiums, um, but now that they cost twenty dollars, maybe even more, twenty four bucks or something for a pack of eight per of camera. them. Yeah, it's like I can't justify spending that kind of money per camera. So, what are you? Are you running Duracells, Energizers? What are you? What are you running? So, I switched up this year a little bit, but I'll t- my main bulk um, is the energi- an Energizer Industrial. Okay. Um, they're yeah. designed they're designed to work in power tools um so they have a little bit higher output is that that yeah, yellow terrible. is that that yellow box yeah uh, okay the yellow box yeah, yeah. yeah. they're yeah. energizer industrial batterymart.com 
you can buy them by the thousand, <laughs> mail them to your house, and uh, you can get a pretty good deal. I don't want to quote the exact price, but I think it was sub three hundred dollars that I bought a thousand last mm-hmm. year. That's actually a pretty good price. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it was it's pretty good price. You're talking less than fifty cents. Yeah. You know, I mean it, it, it's it saves quite a bit. Um, what so, was that again? Plug that website again. It's batterymart.com. Battery Mart. Um, if you sign up for the emails, that's when I I get the notification that says, "Hey, this is forty three percent off if you buy a thousand or whatever." And then I <laughs> jump, jump on, on it. it. Done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, yep. Go ahead and send them to me. And uh, yeah. people, that's that's where the the podcast revenue goes to is straight back to battery. <laughs> I was going to say, we got to skip the car payment this month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but, uh, if you buy them by the thousands, I, I probably have five to 600 inboxes in my garage right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and they come in the, I think they, they come in. The only problem that I don't like is they come in the boxes mm. with the boxes of four. four yeah. Yeah. So you have Classic. the big brick, yeah. With the broke down boxes of four, you're like, just send me like a crate of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You don't need to individually pack four um, for for me because you're kind of wasting my time. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to add mine. You know, I yeah. just need like a big tow to batteries floating around. Yeah, yeah. actually, can um, you just pack that in like a garbage bag for me? <laughs> yeah, just, just send it to me in one of those plastic totes and I'll be solid. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. One thing I will highly suggest on the organization of trail cams. Um, is getting a battery tester. They're uh-huh. literally like four dollars on Amazon. Um, there is multiple times that I like I bought a pack of a thousand and had maybe like six or seven that were no good. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. And you put you put <clears throat> you know you put eight in your trail cam and it don't turn on. You're like what what the hell? You pitch those eight. You grab another eight. You put those in. It turns on. Well, more than likely one of those eight were bad and the other that's seven were good tip. pro tip that's a yeah. pro tip yeah. yeah and then also another <laughs> side note is when you get these batteries out of these trail cams even if your cam says that it's dead um they run off a, a voltage a lot of them run off they need 1.5 and that's why people like lithium because it runs a constant the constant at 1.5 voltage yep. until it's dead but more than likely, a lot of those batteries, when you put them in a battery tester, are still going to read good. Um, now, those batteries I don't put back into cameras, but like for Nerf gun, you know, the electric yeah. Nerf gun, yeah. the remotes, I have a junk drawer with probably 200 batteries that have came out of a trail camera yeah. that I can repurpose for whatever. So like Christmas time. I'd like bring it up. You're, you're the man. You're the go-to guy. Yeah, you are the man. Grandma, grandma's house because I know I'm like don't don't get the double A's. I got that covered. <laughs> else, you're gonna have to get the nine volts. I don't got that, but the double A's I got. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, my nephew was always like, "Hey, you got you got double A's for my." Uh, his like playstation controller or whatever i'm like i got you dude <laughs> I, I think he's still playing on like a playstation maybe it's an xbox one he likes madden on xbox one and it runs off his battery the double yeah. Is, yep. yeah i'm like i'm like i got you dude i'm your man <laughs> i got, got him right there in that drawer <laughs> um, but yeah that's that's, that's awesome. the way i wouldn't suggest running those back in a camera um i've never tried that i'm assuming you could probably get a little more juice out of them um you know, if you're a guy that's checking them every couple of weeks and can monitor the battery life, that's one thing. But for me, I'm not checking these cams very, very fast enough. That's why I, I utilize the the cell cams are the ones that if I want to check something, it's normally a cell. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. No, and a, a lot of people might be thinking like, why are you buying a thousand batteries? Well, you're running a, a ton of cameras. You know, the average guy might run sub 10 cameras. Yeah. Um. Yeah. They don't need to be buying a thousand thousand batteries at no, a time you can buy them in, i think you can buy them in i think the boxes are 24 so you could buy them in the 24 mm-hmm. um but the more you buy the better deal you the get the better deal you know? yeah right you know and that's the same thing with anything even like amazon they have the um the the more you buy the better you get for even the lithiums so, you yeah. know the price goes down um and it's something that they have a shelf life it is limited mm. um but it I'm going to utilize them. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. So I would rather take one hit and then always know in my mind 
that like I don't go in the woods to run cams without 48 batteries in my backpack. And I don't want to go to my garage and not be able to and say, man, I only got 20. Like I only got 20 left. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I got 500. I'm good. Like <laughs> yeah. I, it's one less thing I can think about in the, in the method of I go to my two by 10 shelf <laughs> <laughs> holding the batteries and go, yep, I'm good. I see about 13 boxes up there. You know, yeah. I'm good for now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one less thing to, to add to the mess. Another thing that I will mention with the organization is a um, lot of lot of mapping programs out there. I use HuntStand. They have a trail camera feature on there where you can instead of like marking stuff, they have one just for trail cams. And I mark where it's at by GPS, the number of the cam that it is, and a brief description of what it's looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, because sometimes I'll get a card. It says number 13. In my mind, I'm racking my head like, where's 13? I can get on there, find 13 on hunt stand, and go. it says, oh, it's looking at a scrape underneath the cedar tree. Okay, I know what property it's on. I know what it's looking at. And then kind of kind of go from there. Yeah. That's helped me out a lot. Yeah, I found that you almost get uh, – I don't want to – I'm really dabbling into more trail cameras in the last couple of years, really getting serious with it. I'm probably at like uh, mid thirties, low forties with uh, cells and uh, non non cells together, and I've noticed that like before uh, I start, I got it, I got serious into it, I would always run like sub ten mm-hmm. cameras and like at least my memory I can kind of remember where I put stuff like, if it's just that that amount. But when you start getting into like thirty forty cams, I really learned really quickly that you have to utilize. Onyx, Hunt, Stand, Spartan Forge, whatever you use, and like really get descriptive with it, like what yes. like Cody was saying. Don't just put a trail camera pin there because you're never going to remember what camera it is or you know what it's looking at. Yeah. So I really, I really took that to heart. Um, a lot of times, like with Onyx, you can actually upload a picture. A lot of times, I like take a picture of the trail yep. camera and then I'll actually like get in front of the camera and take a quick little picture. That way, I know like okay, that's what it's looking at. That's the camera. And then if I always go back to Onyx, I can pull up that picture in my description. And it's like, well, I know exactly what camera that is and what it's looking at. Mm-hmm. So I've really utilized that. So if you guys are running a lot of cameras, even more than 10, I'd say definitely try to Onyx, you know, hunt stand something and, and spend the two extra minutes that it takes to get the description. I know a lot of times, like everybody's impatient when they're in the woods. They're like, I got to go to the next camera. Or I got to go set the next one. But I promise you, down the road, it will help out significantly. Yeah, so. I kind of do the same thing. I don't run near as many cameras as you do, but like I'll uh, I'll put the brand and take a picture of it, and then also if it's a good tree or something, like I'll leave the the camera logo there and just change the color. So like for me, if a live camera, the camera's there, it's a blue, and if the I like the location, I'll just turn the color to black. Then so like for next year, I can go there and put it on the. Same oh, tree. gotcha. You're saying change the color of the pin. The pin, yes. Yep, yep, yep. Cool. Yeah, cool. So one thing that I utilize that for not only knowing where the cam's at is when you get to the numbers that you have and you're trying to collect everything, a lot of times I'm like, did I get this cam or is it stolen? <laughs> and sometimes I think stuff's stolen, but it's I get on my hunt stand app and I got it a month and a half ago yeah. while I was out there hunting or something. Right. But before, <clears throat> you know, I would be like, ah, man, someone got this, son of a gun. It was and you. Then now I got to <laughs> Now I got to look and verify that, I was I I was the one guy that I stole from myself. I didn't even know, you know, yeah, <laughs> you were the yeah, villain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I've done that. I'm like going in to pull a cam, and I, but I'm like, man, this thing's deep. And you get back there, and it's not there. And you're like, did I get this thing already? And then you you got it in November on a hunt when you were back there, and yeah. you yeah. said, I'm gonna pull it now. Yeah. And then if you didn't have it marked on that app where it keeps everything in line, um, I'll just delete it. And then yeah. I know, okay, there's no trail campaign here. I probably have it. Yeah. And I tried doing a note system where I broke it down more heavily than I ever did. And it got kind of in depth where I knew what numbers were on what properties. But the problem is, is um, say you got, you know, seven, eight, eight, nine out on this property. Well, two of them you pull and you're not getting any action. So you move those. 
now they're on this property. You got to go back to that note and yeah. change it. When then I just delete the pin, add a new pin. Yeah, that's what uh, I do. Because it gets really complex if you're trying to, if you're moving stuff mid season, um, it's really hard to keep up with what you got going on, at yeah. least for me. Yep. No, I'm yeah. the same way. Yep. Yep. It's hard, definitely. So, yeah. uh, moving on a little bit, like what's the, I know a lot of guys anymore are elevating their cameras. Um, are you mm -hmm. doing that? Or if you are, like, to what height are you kind of, what's the sweet spot really for you? So I uh, one, one thing I have started doing, going back to the batteries, is uh, the cell cam game, they really like lithiums, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, lithiums are the, the name of the game. And with the lithium prices being the way they are, um, I got six solar panels this year. Um, with the solar panels, the higher the better. You know, you get up past a lot of the other smaller trees up the, out of the canopy, um, so I'm hanging stuff like two sticks high in some scenarios. Um, and, uh, what a buddy of mine, um, he, he runs a company. It's like a small company just starting. It's called good sits. He makes a mount that's 3d printed, very reasonable, cheap. Um, he has a full system that he creates where it has a laser where it's, you know, you can see where you're aiming while you're up there. Um, he has like a, a paracord system that you can just pull and slide. And, um, but basically what it is, is it's a, a thing you zip tie to your cam. Um, and it has a, a set screw, um, and it will force the camera away from the tree. So you don't have to find a stick yeah. anymore to get the angle. Um, and they're 10 bucks. So I purchased a bunch of those and I've been running those. Um, and I just keep them on the cams and then if I want an elevated set, that's the cam that I use. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it it has helped with theft in some situations. In some situations, I've had them stolen. I think theft is property-based 100% and never, like, you could run a cam on a bush on this pro on one property, never have a problem with it. You do the same thing on the next one, and it gets stolen every single year. There's just a couple guys out there that are doing it, and uh, I think most people are pretty solid. But if you get stuff stolen on one property, you got to be really—they're going to steal everything, yeah. like everything they see, you know. And yeah. um, I've no, I've noticed that. So a lot of people do that for for theft, get them up there high. Um, but that's that's what I've been using, um, and it's really really helped me um, without. It's really hard to get paracord or that strap tight while you're trying to angle stuff away from a tree. Yeah. It's yeah. just not, and you can buy like the stick and picks and screw them into the tree, which is illegal on public land. That's kind of vague. I know a lot of people use bow hooks and stuff. You're not supposed to screw stuff into trees. This is legal. Um, and it's really effective and it's extremely cheap. Um, yeah. 10 bucks. And it, stays, yeah. It, yeah. Stay, it stays on the cam, which I like. So it packs nice. You pull it out. You have all the variability of angles, and 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 the dude's just like a an absolute savage public land guy who runs as many cams as I do and wanted the system, mm -hmm. and then he made it. And he's like, check this out. I'm like, dude, thank you. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, let me get ten of them. You know, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and then I've been you know going to a couple of shows with him and stuff and hanging out, and he's been he he makes like bow hooks now and uh, uh, GoPro holders and all kinds of stuff that run off of uh, a paracord system instead mm -hmm. of like a strap. Cause a lot of people can't screw stuff in on public land, but yeah. um, elevated sets are great. Um, different cameras respond different to them because um, what a lot of people don't understand is it's not a uh, motion sensor that set these cameras off. It's a difference um, one side of the camera to the other of the sensor. Um, so, if you're angling down at a scrape and your your field of view is much smaller, a lot of cameras aren't going to activate as well as if they are, they're designed to be up. Yeah. They're not mm -hmm. designed to be like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that is one thing to, to take in mind that if you start seeing a lot of problems, um, the one thing that I see the most of is those sun glare pictures. I'm sure you guys have got that. Yeah. Um, your angle down, which seems in theory would get less sun glare, 
but I don't know if it's reflecting off the trees or whatever because you're angled up the leaves and stuff and getting the up flare. But I get a lot of sun glare picks on the angled down sets if they're high. Yeah, if they're really high. Yeah, but I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I kind of wanted to touch base on the height of the camera. Do you feel that having a camera, let's say waist high, will scare or deter a mature whitetail? Or do you think it doesn't matter how high the camera is? I think it's a per deer basis. If you if you see that your buck is does not like cams, then you got to do something. Um, we did we did a, a really cool thing where I like lift twos, right? I like video mode. Well, you got a really hot scrape. You want to get the video content, yeah. um, but you also want to know when stuff's on there if you're going to hunt that scrape. So we ran a mobile cam over a lift two in a couple scenarios. Um, and like I had a buck bedded. It was a sweet buck. It was just one of those deer that came through and never seen, but he had a, a drop time flyer that was like eight inches. Sure. And he's out there bedded, just chewing his cud <laughs> um, on lift two. And you can see the camera flashing. Yep. yep. Like it's flashing and he's just out there chilling. And then some coons come by and it's flashing at them and the buck and the coon are kind of like checking each other out and feeling it out. <laughs> they're chatting. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. They're like, this guy's got two cameras in this spot. I ain't coming here in daylight at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, and that coon's like, yeah, he's dropped hella snacks out of his stand. I like this guy. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, you know, I've seen deer that literally freak. Yep. Um, when they, when they see a camera and then I like that deer, nothing at all, man. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's also like, if you're running a cam dead set on a trail, that deer is facing right into you and, and it gets like, boom, I think that has something to do with it. Or if he's like on a field edge walking by and it's kind of off, or if you're on a scrape and he's working the scrape and kind of into that. Um, but like I said, I think it's per deer basis, and that's something that video mode will tell you yep. instantly yeah. that uh, a regular picture mode will not tell you. Um, so if if there's a buck that I'm really interested, I have a cam on a scrape on video mode to see how aggressive that, that buck is and then also to see how he's reacting to this cam because yep. they know they're there. Yep, they, they do. 100%. 100% know they're there. They're yep. there. They're right up. A lot of them get right up in there and, Sniff it. and yeah. bounce back around and, <laughs> and try to figure out what's going on. And hang on one second. Yeah, I you're apologize. Good. I got to, for some reason, my phone's going to die. I got to plug in too. <laughs> but, anyways, yes, a lot of them get right up in there and try to figure out, like, okay, what what is this? Oh, that's why. You got to plug it all the way in, guys. <laughs> Expert tip. Got to get it all the way in. But uh, a lot of them get right up in there and, and try to figure it figure it out there you and go. get their nose up in the cam. And uh, and then some of them don't even acknowledge it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if I, I would suggest if you're targeting a buck that you really want to kill, get a camera that can run on video mode and see how he reacts to it, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I- I would agree with the, uh, it depends on the deer because most cameras anymore are either like low glow or no glow, um, for the flash at night the, I got a camera back here. That's an old, um, cutty back capture that had like a white flash, like a, a wind up camera type thing. Yeah. And like, you'd get a picture of a, a deer and he'd come in and close to it. And like what you said, he'd get right up in front of the camera and be sniffing it. And then sometimes you'd get a picture of a deer and then that's the only picture you ever get of him mm-hmm. because he's gone. It scared him. Yeah. And that was yeah. 15 years ago, yeah. you know? cameras have came and it's a long hard to way. know whether you scared that deer or not if you just got a picture of it right yeah right um, but i will say this i have never had a deer spook on a scrape on video mode or picture i think there's something he's going to that scrape the, yeah the, the scrape. they're distracted by the scrape yeah, yeah they're distracted but i don't ever run i have noticed if i run a cam really really close to a scrape i get less pictures though I kind of offset the scrape. I don't hang, I don't hang the camera on the tree that the scrapes on. I angle away from it. I've seen that that seems to have very success. And then I also don't know if it works or not, 
but seems to it i like to have a tree that's a bigger diameter than the camera yep or I or i put it in a bush <laughs> hella bush cams out the there. old bush cams. <laughs> yeah i so, take a take a paracord wrap as much bush as i can pull it tight mm. <laughs> and tie it off <laughs> <laughs> i i did that one year i got some good pictures off of it yeah bush yeah. cams yeah. yeah they're nice yeah yeah so I kind of wanted to touch base on what you were what you were talking about. At least for me, I've noticed that um, they don't spook necessarily on. How am I going to word this? I have found that that mature deer do not spook necessarily on a camera specifically, but the location of the camera specifically. You were talking about how. Um, don't put a camera, like if they, if you're on a trail, like a lot of guys will like, I'm going to put it right, right in front of them. So they're like walking into the camera. I never do that because I always go like out to the side, you know, 10 feet or so from that trailer, from that scrape. I don't like if a deer's walking, I don't like to put a camera like right in their eye view. And then if you've got a scrape, like a lot of times I'll try to put the camera like on the back side of the scrape, if that makes sense, looking at the scrape, not like on the tree or like, mm-hmm. so if that buck's walking to the scrape, I want to put it, I want to put the camera behind it. So that way he's never, his focus is on that scrape, right? So he's always walking into it or he's, he's circling downwind or whatever, but you'll find out that there's a certain direction that they always like to come into scrapes. And I always put the camera on the back side of it because I found that, like Cody was saying, if you put it on, the tree or like waist high or something it seems like you either get a deer that doesn't care or you get a deer that like you know will blow out well i found that just by moving the camera location you don't have them deer blow out anymore because you know it's probably suffers a little bit on quality of the camera pick but like i never i by doing that i've never had a deer i like to hang them high about uh you know six to ten foot range and i like to hang them like off um, kind of like out of the way, I guess you could word it. And I've really found that I've not had any deer really get boogered mm-hmm. since doing that. And um, I used to put them like smack dab right in the middle, looking at them, you know, as they're walking down the trail. And since I've done that, no issues. Better results. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's bulletproof because nothing's bulletproof in the woods. You're always going to have that one deer. But I'd say like 90%, 95% has been a big improvement. Mm-hmm. So yeah, one benefit that people don't think about and the reason I stopped doing it initially was, um, you know, you have a few deer spook as well, but you also have to check that camera. And if you check that camera directly on the trail that you think that deer is going to be walking on, yep. you're leaving your ground scent on that trail when you could be leaving your ground scent at least 20 yards away from yep. said X spot where you want to kill that deer, yep. especially if you're going into pull a cam and hunt at the exact same time. Um, yeah. you yeah. know, you want to, a lot of times I'll be like, okay, this is the tree that I would hunt. If I was going to hunt X spot, I'm going to run a cam on this tree. And then when I hang my stand, I pull the card. So there's no added ground scent anywhere else in the area. Mm-hmm. Like you said, sometimes you sacrifice quality, um, of the picture for that. But if you're trying to be like, I, you know, you have a buck in mind. If you can get a half rack of that deer, you know it's him. Yeah. Like that that's all that counts. All you need had, to know is that he's yeah. there. Yeah. 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 We had a picture of a buck that homie killed, Pickles, and he had a bald spot on the left side of his rear end. And we got a bunch of pictures of that said bald spot and no rack or no nothing. But we knew it was him. Yeah. And that's all we needed. Like yeah. I'm not gonna move the camera. And it, and he literally killed the deer opening evening out of the tree that the camera was hanging on. Hmm. Yeah, is that that deer yeah. that uh daylighted like 30 some days in a row or whatever 18 days yeah yeah, yeah that's cool 18 days exact same trail yeah i've never seen anything like it talk about being killable send, <laughs> send me oh, one dude. of them bucks and he was a dandy too he's yeah. like 150 yeah. inch deer yeah 152 inch deer yeah, yeah. just every Public single land. day yeah everything oh that you think would make a deer change they picked the corn. They disked it in. <laughs> Didn't phase I was it. like, oh, he's gone. Nope, still there. <laughs> Wind change? Nope. Temperature change? 
Nope. It would be <laughs> it'd be seventy five one day. I'm like, he's gonna get up eight minutes later. He'd be up thirty minutes earlier. I'm like, what, what is, there's not there's everything that the book they wrote for deer hunting. This deer does not abide by. You, <laughs> you don't, don't care. You don't like it. Yeah. yeah. You don't like any of the rules. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but it also cost him, you know, opening evening. 150 inch public game buck just bam right off the dude, rim that's you know? so awesome send me one yeah. of those this year would you oh dude yeah. <laughs> very um, i had another deer like that that i called sunshine um and uh he daylighted daylighted daylight daylight this area and uh i want to say it was maybe 10 days and that's why i named him sunshine because it was always out in the daylight <laughs> um and uh when i'm there in october in the morning i was like i just gonna get eyes on this deer you know and uh Got eyes on him, passed him, um, hunted the north side of the farm with homie that night, and he she ended up killing him. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. he daylighted in the morning and the evening, and my camera battery died the middle of him coming in, and he was got a bed in that area. He was I could tell he'd been bedded in there, and I was already set up, um, and I was kind of digging for the battery, and uh, he didn't see me, but he knew was something in the tree, and he didn't like, so he forced north and i think that's why we killed him on the north side of the farm that mm. night we never had trail cams pictures of him up there but since i bumped him a little north in the morning i think that he just continued he said there's something south of here that i did not like this morning i'm not going to go back there and and see if it's still there i'm going to go north yeah yeah and go up here and check this this we had a little oat food plot and he come out bumping does like the 25th of october and homie killed him um, so that's, awesome. that's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You can, um, yeah. So, um, like placing cameras, like summertime, um, yeah. w- we kind of want to touch base on like summertime and then like early season, um, scrape season, kind of October. And then like during the rut and, and the winter. Yeah. So now that we've kind of touched based on all of like the, I guess you would say like placement and like, you know, fun facts and like fun little quirky, you know, details or whatever. Why don't we get into like the meat and potatoes of the podcast if we can, if you've got time, Cody. I know that we're running a yeah. little bit lighter than we than we probably should, but I've, I'm really yeah, enjoying this fine. podcast. I'm, I'm liking it. It's very informational, and I think the guests will also and the listeners will also enjoy it. So why don't we get into like, all right, right now when this podcast drops, it's summertime, maybe full velvet racks, late July, early August time frame. What are you doing with your cameras right now? And why? And why, yeah. So I break it down into two categories. I'm going to have the cameras that are for new areas that I really don't know what the hell is going on. And then I have cameras that are for areas that I've hunted in the past and I know what's going on. Um, that's two completely different ball games for hunting and for cams. Um, so I'll start with the area that I don't know first. What I'm going to do there is I'm going to look for the best place to get as much pictures of what quality of deer is in the area are these pictures going to be pictures of daylight deer more than likely not i'm trying to get an idea of what is what is in the area so i'm looking for heavy heavy trails coming off of ag you know going back into the timber i'm looking for scrapes uh, i'm looking for pinch points anything that i can get a deer picture of a, of a shooter deer where I think he might be in the area, just to know what kind of quality of deer is there. Now, running those cams, I have have killed deer doing that the same year. You know, get pictures of a deer um, and be able to go in there and make a plan and kill them. But I, I have a three-year rule where I feel like if I have three years of history with a buck, I have a really good chance of killing that deer. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I have, I'm on the third year. I've got the two years. And now I got the third year, I feel like I have really good chance to, to kill that deer. And a lot of the deer that I've killed that I've targeted, it took me that three years um, to, to have that really good encounter or to get the kill, one or the other. Um, so the, the properties that I have, I've hunted in the past, I'm going back to that historical data. What cams were good? Where did I get pictures? And what cams were not good? Um, I'm also kind of cherry picking off of any other data that I can get um, from said neighbors or other people on the public land. You know, they're getting some pictures of some good deer. I'm going to kind of drift that way as well. Um, but same thing goes, man, there, you cannot be a scrape 
uh, a ground scrape for a trail cam. Those are best friends, man. Mm-hmm. Um, cause what are we trying to do with trail cams? We're trying to get bucks on trail cam. Now, a lot of those bucks, um, I read a, uh, study here recently that, uh, the most frequented buck to a scrape is a two or three year old. Um, the four and five year old deer, I think they were like 7% of them hit scrapes. Um, so what I have learned that is kind of a, a, a hidden gem secret for, for your listeners is if you run a cam on a scrape, run it 20 to 40 yards prominent downwind of that scrape. Yeah. That deer might not hit the scrape. He's going to go through that area and you're going to get him walking past that scrape, not even acknowledging it is there, but he's scent checking that scrape as mm-hmm. he's going through. Yep. Um, I've had huge success of not getting a deer raking the branches and stuff. Um, but like summertime, I hang that sucker right on the scrape, dude, because they're walking right up to that thing and they're hitting it. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to, you know, October and the rut, I really like that 30 yard buffer downwind with the cam facing the scrape. So you're still getting the scrape activity, but you're also getting the stuff that's just going downwind of that. Um, now that gets kind of tricky. If you got like a scrape and then another 30 yards, you got a scrape and then another 30 yards, you got something yeah. you're like, you just kind of got to pick your best odds of how you think a deer would work into the area and then go downwind of that and hang your cam. You're hanging your cam and you're like, I'm not really on the scrape. I'm not really on a trail. I'm just kind of covering this blanketed area of timber. Um, but it's worked really, really good for me. Um, and that the other one is historically good pinch point areas just for historical data. People say historical data in areas. Um, for, for me, historical data is pinch point related like heavily. Like if a deer works through a pinch point um, November 3rd, I believe he's going to work through that pinch point within 24 hours the next year. Um, I'm pretty dead set in that belief. Now, a lot of people say he was on this field, you know, with a doe or whatever. He's going to be back in here in the next year in 24 hours. That's pretty vague for me. Mm -hmm. If you get a lone buck going through a pinch point in a certain area of the year, good chance that that deer survives. He's going to be back within there within that 24 hour time period is what, what I'm seeing. So I will run that cam in that pinch point just for historical data. Um, and I, I love a good pinch point cam anyways, because that's the best place that I have success getting daylight pictures of bucks mm-hmm. is in, in timber pinch points, not like a field edge pinch point or yep. something. Yep. Um, and another, the third area that I really, really like is a transition zone trail cam. Uh, maybe it's CRP to timber. Maybe it's uh, oaks to like a oak, uh, a wide open oak timber to a really, really thick kind of elm ash hedge timber. That line, that buffer line, I've had really success killing deer on that line. And I like to run cams. Say it's a, say you can hunt 400 yards of that line. I like to have one facing one part of the transition. So one facing the CRP here, another 150 yards down. I like one face in the timber that direction. Yeah. And I've covered both sides of that transition line, two different assets. Um, and I'm able to get a lot of the Intel there. Um, so that's, that's my good go-to would be scrapes. That's your absolute best friend. If you want to get buck pictures. Um, and then those pinch points for historical data and those transition lines for just, kind of seeing what's in the area because does bucks everything loves that transition line for some reason man that's that's a white tails uh, yeah they're edge animals yeah they they love that diverse habitat and they can bounce back and forth and Mm. and get the best of both worlds yeah yeah and it's funny that you you mentioned something about summertime scrapes so i actually have uh how many five or six uh cell cameras right now uh down in kentucky on some uh, big, big public, and uh, I put them. I I really targeted. So it's it's uh it's big timber. There's no ag anywhere. So I really targeted uh, community scrapes down in the bottoms, and almost daily, I have a picture of 
either multiple bucks because they're starting to grow now. You start to see nubs, either multiple bucks or a buck or a doe, almost daily hitting them scrapes. Now, it's not them little, you know, I'm going to call them like aggressive scrapes where a buck will make something. I'm talking the the ones that are like the size of the hood of your truck down in like a bottom where a bunch of fingers are beating and stuff. It's uh, it's the way they communicate. And I think that a lot of people will say that like whitetails will only hit a scrape during, let's say, breeding season or like getting amped up for November. But I feel that depending on maybe an ag, that might be accurate to an extent but i feel like you got to remember that in my mind if you're hunting big timber how are they communicating okay so like when you have an ag field them deer are going out to the ag they're communicating an ag you'll see a lot of scrapes on the edge of the Mm -hmm. of the field that's how they're communicating but in big timber there is no there's no ag field no so how are those deer communicating back and forth they're communicating on scrapes they're communicating excuse me they're communicating on the licking branches so I feel like on big timber, if you can find those hub scrapes down the bottom where a bunch of different ridges dump down in, really utilize that. That's my go-to right now. And, and honestly, almost daily on every single camera, I've found some really nice scrapes that I'm really excited about for next year, or for this year, I should say. And uh, every day, yeah, it's like clockwork. So, And then I also I wanted to mention as well, Cody, you said edge lines. Here's a little tip that I've I've kind of learned is um, a really good spot. There's a lot of ag around us in northeastern Ohio. A really good spot to to kind of utilize like that what's in the area is if you have a transition from beans to corn. I'm not even joking. Yep. Go get you a stick or something, stick it in the ground, yep. and just point it they on that edge. That, dude. Dude, they, yeah, they love that transition. They travel yeah. that edge line of the corn and beans. Like you'll, I promise you, the biggest buck in the area will walk do. literally right on the edge of that corn field or that bean field and just stick a camera right there. You'll find out. Yeah, yeah. you'll find out. One thing I will say about those summertime scrapes, they are a heartbreaker. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you get so many bucks on there, man. And yep. it's just like, you're like wow like i I have one in particular that there's always a really 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 nice deer or two or three on there and then they're never there and then i have one that i'm extremely excited about this year um i had three bucks most consistent ever in the morning in october hitting scrapes um i know i know they're going back to bed and they're just they're not raking the ground. They're just literally, if it's on video mode, they're just licking the scrape for three seconds. You know, this yep. mm-hmm. batch of the grouped up still, you know, hitting it, um, coming off the ag. I opted not to hunt there. They're all really, really solid three or four year old deers. Um, that 130, 140. One has some inside kicker points, some base points. Hey, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> right, man, you know, he's got those inside inside points started, um, and I didn't hunt that. Um, I was real tempted to go in there and just get a look at a couple. You know, yeah, there's this yeah. big eight that had one split two on well, one side, probably like 135. I was like, ah, he's he's pulling my arm. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh god, you know. But um, I had my eyes on some other deer, um, and uh, I have I had one deer that I haven't told showed anybody that I was chasing, um, on a piece of private, uh, that just, I just got my butt kicked. I wasted a lot of my season on him. Um, but he is a, a you know, a 70 class deer. Um, and I kind of got, I kind of got eye opened on it a little bit. I think I have a better idea, um, of where it was going from. I got, I got some permission to go on some ground to help a guy, I hunt on one piece, the deer's coming from the other piece, and I'm trying to catch him when he's going onto the piece that I can hunt. Mm-hmm. He owns the piece to the north where this deer is coming from. Um, I don't want to tell him that there's a giant deer up there because there's <laughs> other guys that hunt it as well, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go, hey, man, I want to go up there. This buck I've been chasing is up there. Um, but he needed some help staking out property lines. Um, he had a logger come in, and I was out there. I, he was like, you have an app that kind of shows property lines. I'm like, yeah, it's it's pretty solid. We can find the corner posts and stuff with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I got to go up in there and see the sign and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, Alternative and, motives, eh? Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> I'm just help, here to help. help. Take stuff out. 
Um, and uh, then I actually, for doing that, he actually gave me permission to hunt up there. Ooh, he was like, you help me out, help. man. I didn't even ask him. He was just like, yeah, you know, this is too far for most guys to walk anyways. Um, so I'm going to dedicate this spot just to you. And I'll tell everybody else to stay out of here. Dude, I'm like, where do I find one of those? <laughs> yeah. I'm out there. I'm out there ready to go to the wedding chapel with this guy. I'm, like, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not letting the cat out of the bag, you know, but I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, Oh yeah, I really appreciate that. You know? Yeah, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I, I did my part with, uh, nothing, nothing expecting nothing and and yeah. graciously it came back to me you know so that's awesome um, but yeah I, I wasted a lot of time on that so i'm excited to to run a cam back on that scrape hmm. um in the summer and see what those bucks did because yeah. it's one of those spots where if if i can access it that's going to be the key if i can access it without bumping them in yeah. the morning that's a that's a me dragging out a hammer in october early october yeah like dude, first get week. out of the way yeah 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 <laughs> dude, that's so, them early october dear i tell you yeah. don't in the cold oh it just takes so much pressure off you you know oh, it feels so good it, it the whole persona of deer season changes when yeah. you kill one before october 20th like you're just like i'm good man i'm holding out for a giant yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so now let's let's go back into the the, the uh, strategy of what putting cameras. So we kind of covered summer. Now let's get into like uh, early October, mid uh, mid October. I know we kind of touched base on some scrapes. Maybe like let's just do like all of October, I guess. What's yeah. your game plan? Of actually, let's rewind. Let's do later October because summer it kind of ties into like that early season yeah. hunting. So let's do late yeah. October. What are you thinking? So the late October, um, I have two different types of cams for that as well. I have my uh, um, my deer cam slash people cam. Um, I like to say just to kind of see what the pressure is like in certain areas. I have my edge cams that I really like to run in that area that that time of year. And what an edge cam is is a cam that you would never think that there'd be a giant buck on that cam but that's when how this deer comes into this property during that time of the year and i'm getting one of the very first pictures of him on that property Mm -hmm. in these same areas um i consistently got a uh that he ended up being 193 inches when he got killed but show when when he was 150s 170 190 he entered the property around the same time in the same area and i got a trail cam pictures of him Mm -hmm. and i wouldn't get any pictures of him before that but i would get a picture for him in those three to four days um and it was not where i hunted that deer during season i would just know okay oh he's back he's alive because i have no intel of this deer ever existing before right. october 24th you know yeah, yeah. um and every year i'm like is he alive is he alive so i'm running this edge cell cam but the edge cell cams will throw you for a loop too because i've had some of the biggest deer i've ever had on camera on one of those edge cell cams and it sends you on a wild goose chase of trying to kill this deer yeah <laughs> and that was that's a that's, that was a wild um a wild year. I was bucked out in October. Homie had a tag left. We got three bucks over 170 on cam. And <laughs> we're at work. And one's just daylight, daylight, daylight. Mm. I dozed. And we're like, oh, my God, we messed up. He's all over this property. Like three or four different cams within 50 acres. He's on every single one of them daylight. Mm-hmm. Running all over the place. Same day, 12 hours after we got trail camp pictures of him in the morning. He got shot on public three miles away by the Ooh, crow flies. Wow. No joke. That deer got on a doe and, or lost a doe and just said, Kept I'm going. sailing until yeah. I find something. <laughs> and where he got shot is one of those guy was just out there trying to kill a doe real close to the parking lot. Oh, killed, wow. <laughs> killed a 170, you know? Classic. And, and uh, we lost the deer, and I'm at the local like uh, breakfast spot you know and the mm-hmm. waitress knows that i'm deer hunting stuff and she's like oh look what my father-in-law got yeah. and i'm like <laughs> bro <Yeah. laughs> like where'd you kill that you know and and she's like oh they got it out there on the public i'm like 
at first I thought they were lying, you know, yeah. I'm like, ah, I don't know about that. He told you the wrong spot, you know, cause <laughs> yeah. I got drunk here from Kevin, but I verified it. And, um, uh, yeah, the, so I'm running those edge cams just so what, to let me know that. So, what's so, that? Sorry. What, so what, um, what are you putting them on? Like you're saying an edge cam, but like what, what do you, so uh, a lot of times it's like one of them in particular is 25 yards off of a heavy, heavy highway and the f- closest timber from this point to the west where these deers are deer are coming from is probably a quarter mile. It's all ag. Um, and those deer, I found the heaviest trail off of that road with the quickest option for them to get to cover from the west area gotcha. to get into this piece. I'm running a cam there, um, and it, it's it's when it, when it started, it was I'm running this cam, and it was there's going to be a 170 inch drop time buck on this, this. You watch, <laughs> and then that year there was a 170 double main beam drop buck on that cam. <laughs> oh my! Like, I'm gonna start saying never, that. <laughs> yeah, never. I mean, chocolate rack, mainframe 12, double drops, three quarters way down the beam. Wow! I'm like. What Good this grief. is a this is made up. Someone got a <laughs> Google screenshot yeah, yeah, off the yeah, internet yeah. and put it on this SD card. <laughs> um, but that was the joke. Like I'm pulling the card on the phone with homie. I'm like, there's gonna be a double drop, you know, giant on this, and there is. And then yeah. we were like, whoa, we got we got something in this area where the big one, you know, like they just transitioned through there. Yeah. But that's what it is. Another one is um, a water pinch. I'm really big on if you can find a water pinch that splits a property. Um, maybe it's a, a crossing in a river or maybe you're in an area where there's like the small ponds or small lakes, a strip mine area, a duck hunting reserve. There's those water pinches mm-hmm. where yep. this pinch connects a giant block of timber in this pinch to this block of timber. Yeah. Um, and that's one of those other edge cams where could I ever kill the buck there? More than likely never. But it gives me an idea of I need to start hunting where I've seen him in the past, where I've got trail cam pictures in the past because he's back in here. Yeah, lets um, you know right away when he's entering the property yeah. then. And then another one of the, the edge cams is there's a, like you said, there's a really, really hot community scrape where maybe it's on the edge of a field, maybe it's in the timber, but a ton, a ton of deer visit this scrape. And maybe you got a buck that comes to that scrape, you know, Every October 25th, maybe at night, maybe in the daylight, maybe he's just making his loop, you know, and he's consistently on that scrape. That's one of those edge cams where I know I'm not going to be able to kill this deer. He's only there for a day or two, but he hits this scrape and it lets me know the deer's still alive. He's still in the area. It's time to make a a plan to to hit those deer Mm -hmm. Um, because that time frame of the year, the most recent information is what is going to kill that time of year. Like you need the stuff right now. Yeah. Those yep. cams that you're running on a scrape and a bottom that you can't get to are irrelevant to anything that you're doing until next year. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I'm looking for this bucks in the area. Um, how can I hunt him five days from now? Like, cause I could do that. Yeah, I pulled the cam. He's in the area. I, okay, it's it's three days out from when I encountered him because um, he was there on the twenty fourth, and I, you know, I pulled it on the twenty fifth, and he's there on the 29th. I encountered him on the 29th. You can make an action plan then, but those other cams that you're running on the edge of a field that you don't check, and you need to check it, and there's a buck there four days ago during that time of the year, it the, it's not really that solid of intel because mm-hmm. you have no idea where that buck is the easiest and the hardest to kill within those three weeks of the year. Yep. He's going to be the most daylight, but he's going to be the most unfrequent of, you know, any kind of pattern during that type of year. Yeah. Um, that's why a lot of like guys that love chasing one buck and targeting one buck absolutely despise the rut. Yeah. Yep. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They're just so, all over the place at that point in time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm utilizing mobile cams on scrapes. Um, I'm heavily, I check my mobile cams every day during that time period. Um, scrapes are key. 
um, outside of doe bedding. Don't even have to be downwind. A lot of people say downwind. It, that's great, but an, a heavy trail where you think a buck could be going into a doe bedding and you can get a mobile trail camp pick of him. That mm-hmm. can give you a lot of intel during that time of year. Um, and most of that is during that time of year. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to cherry pick a new buck. I'm trying to go after a buck that I already have some intel. So it's going to be a historically good spot on cam where I'm targeting a buck and I've ran that cam in the same spot for the last three years or so. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm utilizing during that time frame. Gotcha. Yeah, makes yeah, sense. Yeah. I like it a lot. You want to go to November? November, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, so for November, are you kind of utilizing the same pattern as far as pinch points? Like you mentioned the water pinch points and stuff like that, or do you have a different setup for November time? Um, November, it's all does, man. The The does are king. You you can't get in front of a buck hitting a scrape. The scrapes are shut off. Yeah, they're yeah. not even getting at. They're they're useless. They're they're gonna fire back up here. Potentially, some are gonna fire back up here a little later. But those scrape cams, they're kind of out the game. Um, and I am heavily heavily hunting does at that period. I'm trying to put myself in the area where I know a shooter buck is next to the most does I can heavy emphasis on entrance and exit because you cannot spook the does or the bucks won't be there in daylight. The does got to come out in daylight for to be able to kill the buck during that time of the year in daylight. Um, So there's one spot I got on an urban piece. I could hunt that spot 30 times and never educate a deer as long as I have the right wind. It's that good. Um, Then there's other spots that I hunt one time and I can see an impact of seeing less does on the field. Um, I have one spot. I hunted it first week of October. I seen 30 plus deer um, on that, on that field. I bumped six on the way out. Literally can't get off the field. I'm on, I'm on the furthest away from where you can get in the action, but not be in the action. Yeah. Um, and uh, next hunt automatically seen less deer Then during the rut. I seen no deer on that deer uh, on that field. Like the does were getting there at dark. Extremely cold temps, muzzleloader season. I'm shooting a doe five minutes of daylight left because she just got on the field. Wow, that's how man. much that pressure has an impact. And it wasn't just me hunting it; it was other people permission on that property as well. Um, in my ignorance, I was deciding not to hunt bucks because I didn't want to pressure the does thinking, man, I'll get them. I'll get them in the rut coming to these fields. The does are coming. Um, I'm going to do the complete opposite this year. I'm going to burn that spot early, try to get on the bucks and then kind of save the other spots for, for later, mm-hmm. you know, save the urban piece for later. Um, Cause I know if I don't burn it, someone else is going to burn it. Yeah, it's yeah. not going to be good during chucking it or muzzleloader anyways. Yeah. Um, Cause I was kind of banking on that spot of 30 plus does in the area. They're all feeding. This is one of the only two ag fields within remote distance of where any of these deer can travel. Um, there should be bucks hitting edge scrapes and running does all over this thing yeah. during shotgun and muzzleloader. And there's nothing because they're educated because at of, that point because of the pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause of the pressure. Yeah. So, um, that's what I'm doing in November. Um, and it, same thing. It's most recent information. You can have 30 red cams out there. You check that cam and you have a picture of a buck four days ago might help you more than likely it's going to get your hopes up and it ain't going to be yeah. worth a damn. Yeah. I agree. I agree. It's, it's all recent Intel. Yeah. doesn't yeah. matter what he was doing four days ago. It's, it has to be, what is he doing today? What is he doing tomorrow? Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's when those edge cams play in huge. Cause you get a picture of him in an area it's dark. Um, but you're like, okay, he's on this property. Where was he? You know, where did I get a trail cam picture of him three days from that when I could hunt him last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, then you could start kind of be like, okay, he was on this ridge on this cam. You know, even if it's dark, you have an idea where that deer was. And you could say, okay, he's here. 
Now in three days, he was here last year. Where in between We're can in I the middle. count of this year? Yeah, yeah somewhere. Um, that that has really helped me over the years, especially when I started hunting those bigger acre public lands where you can kind of see a deer transition from one side to the other, you know, in a day and yeah. not. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And then, and uh, then from, then from November 25th to December 25th, I cannot find a shooter buck in daylight at all. That is the absolute struggle bus time for me that that time period is just not good for me i don't know why when I does think it's uh, i'm running a lot of my assets for that rut on scrapes and then i'm not transitioning those to other places mm-hmm. um but that's after the first gun season yeah i was gonna ask that when the gun yeah. when the gun season happens yeah mm-hmm. yeah after the after the rut after that first gun season second gun season starting <laughs> um it's just not a good time for me. Um, and that is when I have the least amount of pictures of bucks besides that, uh, Thanksgiving time period, Mm -hmm. you know, right there, I see a little bump. And then after that, dude, it's like, Mm -hmm. I mean, until December 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, that week of Christmas to new year's in my area, we always get a really cold snap. Yeah. Some reason during that time frame, we get that cold snap. I get on deer instantly. Boom, they're there. Mm-hmm. I know where they're going to be. It just takes a lot to get them to go there. Yeah, you know. Um, and uh, that's I killed last year, December thirtieth. Um, and it was got a trail cam picture of a buck. It was like told my wife. I said, "I'm gonna go shoot this buck tomorrow." <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> Went in there and uh, killed that buck. Uh, crazy encounter of a of a hunt, um, but late season I'm really good at getting bucks on cam. Mm-hmm. But like I said, that that November, late November to all the way through December, I'm no good at it. I'd really love to take some advice. A lot of people struggle in October. I struggle in that time frame heavily. Yeah, um, in my area. Yeah. So I killed my buck last year, uh, the 18th of December. And the biggest advice that I can give, because I, I, I don't I don't really see the drop off in that time. It does get a lot harder. Definitely don't see them on the food sources. You know, scrapes are dead, obviously. If you got a good community scrape, you might get one hitting it, you know, once a week or something just to see what's in the area. But I've found that I don't know what you hunt, like your terrain, but I've found that like you got to go, and this is going to sound so cliche and so obvious, but you got to go to like those spots that are out of the way, the thermal hubs, the the spots where like if you were a buck and you wanted to stay alive, where would you go? And I know that sounds obvious, but I find a lot of success in bowls where they have a lot of swirling winds and stuff because after the gun season, you know, obviously they're on they're on their A game. They're wanting to survive. I, I find a lot of bucks like in bowls in timber. And then actually, actually where I killed my buck last year was in a bowl. And then I find them a lot in like just out of the way, like ditches and stuff, uh, small timber lines, stuff like that. And then it's kind of like they transition from those spots that are like those early season uh, October bedding areas. And they, 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 especially the really mature deer, they'll go to these like spots that, you know, the off the wall spots that people talk about in that time frame, just because in my mind, they're, they're done with the rut they're tired they want to recover they don't want to be bothered so they go into places where one they can smell or see a very large area and they have the food and water within let's say less than a mile and i really have a lot of success with uh, i hunt a lot of big timber though so i don't really hunt a lot of ag so like the bowls and big timber i find them so they go off of the points so like uh let's say october time frame they'll bed and they'll bed on the points or they'll bed like three quarters of the way up and they're there, you know, they have that off wind coming off their back, the leeward, the leeward uh, side of the ridge. But then late season, for one, they want to get out of the elements, so they're going to go lower. So they're going to go low in those bowls, and they're going to be on the, uh, you know, offside uh, south slope 
facing ridges and stuff like that. So that's at least what I've found. Um, I'm no expert by all means, but if that helps yeah, that's you. That's good advice. Something yeah. I'll, I'll definitely think about doing next year. Um, because during that time period, also, I've hunted, you know, I've hunted, like last year, 118 days straight. Yep. Um, I kind of try to focus back on the, the family. You got Christmas coming up. You mm-hmm. got stuff like that. So I definitely hunt less in that time, but I'm still running the cans. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm just losing. In theory, you know, you've had the rut where the most deer die. You have your, your gun season where, you know, a lot of deer die. So you should lose. You should have some deer fall off. But even my survivor bucks are ghosts during that time. I just think that in my area, the deer do not move unless they absolutely have to. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, I'd believe it. I agree. They're in there. They're in those little haunts that everybody talks about. Like yeah. everybody says they go in a groundhog hole. Well, it's kind of true. Like they go into them places where, you know, obviously it's going to make, it's going to sound like common sense, but if you're not getting them on your camera, then they're not there, you know? And, uh, I found that. So like when I said bowl, probably a lot of listeners and are like, okay, well that's a, you know, bulls can be huge in big timber. Like, where are you putting your camera? Well, on the benches. So there, there will always be a bench somewhere in that bowl. And I always run that camera on that bench because it's easy access. It's a highway, et cetera. And they'll bed either above it or below it, depending on wind direction. But they always seem to work back on that bench when they, when they go up and down the ridges. So is this a little advice? Um, it's what I've found. So, yeah. But yeah. I don't know. What else, anything else, Kev? No, we kind of covered everything previously. I know. I really so. thanks Cody a lot for that was a lot of information and hopefully our listeners and our viewers definitely took that all in and got yeah. the old pen and paper out because that was a good one. That was a really good one. I, I learned a lot. I got a I got a question for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something we've all kind of talked about doing. Have you ever done this? Um say you have a tree and you put a camera, you know, three or oh, four yeah, cameras yeah. all the way around the tree to see what you're missing with your one camera? Have you ever done that? Yeah, like- I've never done that. I have ran, like I said, I have ran two facing the same direction just yeah. to see how they would react. I have never ran said cam forward and backward except on a late season food plot. I will run two cells front and back gotcha. on a stick and pick. Yeah. On a stick and pick up next to a tree. Like if I have a scrape tree or whatever, I'll put it out there in the scrape tree. I know they're not going to be hitting the scrape. Mm -hmm. Just trying to figure out exactly what is on that. Um, And and you, it's so weird. Um, I don't know why. What I've noticed during those those smaller late season food plots is what I like to do. There's one spot that they the deer all really like to eat, and I don't know why. If Mm -hmm. it's cover based or if it's more palatable in those spots or other deer are there, so they want to eat what, so that deer can't get a one more bite. You know, they're trying <laughs> to get it. Um, but it seems like there's this like little hot spots of, okay, here's a really hot spot of this. And then the, the, you know, the brassicas or whatever could be a foot tall over there and they're not even messing with them, but they're all hovered right here. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times I've really ran one cam and think nothing's on that plot. And then you go out there and hunt it, and there's tracks all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, this the, the cam is not showing you the whole story. So that front and back cam during late season um, most definitely is, is a great tactic. But during the actual season, like it would be great if a guy wanted to run a cam on a scrape and the downwind side of a scrape. Yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking. You know? yeah. yeah, because you'll be blown away when you take that cam off that scrape how many bucks do you start getting especially if it's like on a field edge a lot of them a lot of guys run here's the scrape they're running the cam here but the field's out this way yeah if you run that thing angled to the scrape with the field in the back you start picking up a lot of stuff that's going downwind of that kind of that's yeah. cool that's cool. That scrape. yeah that's cool do you think cody touching back on what you were saying about that food plot where they like to eat a certain section is that wind based just for my own curiosity. It very well could be. The buck that I killed um, last year was funny. There was two other small bucks that came to the plot. All the bucks came to the plot in a different direction. Um, and they all came from the, 
it'd be the Western side. So I had that West win, but there's no cover to the West to me for them really to come out of. Um, the year before, there was a little bit of cover to the Northwest, and we had a buck come out, and, and uh, homie missed that deer, shot right below it. Um, but I called him Buzz Lightyear after that because he <laughs> like hit his elbow and, and shaved some of the hair off of him and gave him a buzz cut. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, he, they, it's the this the plot they it, it's consistently every year it's the same spot. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And um, must have that good fertilizer. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a pain because I have a scrape na- a natural scrape tree yeah. in that. Yeah. And it's they're always like right on the edge of out of the shooting because that scrape tree's there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I gotta like trim the top of it out or something so I can shoot through there. Um, but I don't want to like completely destroy the tree because there's like seven or eight ground scripts around it every year. Yeah, you know, yeah. and um, I've never killed anything other than late season on that spot. But I don't hunt it a lot. I I hunted it early last year and I passed a pretty good buck um that i had trail cam pictures of i was like i'm gonna go in there and look at him you know one of those um and i seen him and ended up passing him. but other than that i've never really even had a lot of deer in daylight there except in late season Mm -hmm. and it's just kind of like a bowl um and crp edge up next to timber with a creek that comes through um and uh but yeah that hunt the, the deer came to the field same thing. They're all feeding in that one area. And I was like, the, the two smaller bucks I could have got a shot out of. Of course, the buck that I wanted to kill was kind of off to the side, not able to kill. And I'm just waiting them out, waiting them out. And coyotes come out, chase the deer off the food plot. I'm pissed. Like, <laughs> like the night's over. I'm packing up my bag. It's freezing cold. I'm like, I wasted the whole night. I could be at home, you know, and, uh, and the deer runs back onto the plot and I stop him and shoot him. I'm like, <laughs> this is meant to be, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. the two small bucks had kind of carried the coyotes away. He was circling back probably to where he knew the direction he came from was safe. Yeah. Um, did the old rabbit trick where they go out there and do the, the circle and come yeah. back. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And I was able to, to kill him, but, um, I don't know what it is about that the sweet spot on a food plot. I mean, maybe it's something the listeners see as well. There's a sweet spot on, on the yeah. food plots. I don't, yeah, know. I don't know. I don't run enough food. I don't even have any food plots out to be honest. So I don't, I don't have, I would say that home. if you, for like the, for me, the best thing that I have found for success is oats and clover early, late season food plot. Don't even think about sitting on it. Don't even go to it run a cam on it late season and there be there dude <laughs> it's it's if it's in the right spot and you historically had bucks hit that plot it and it takes a lot like you'll be like man they're not there there's snow on the ground and then there'd be that cold temp it takes like three days of really really cold and then boom daylight they're yeah they're on it you know Absolutely. we that buck buzz Lightyear was on there with three other bucks that night um biggest deer on the plot we were like okay we got to go it was real temp negative feel was real real feel was negative 13 that day <laughs> we went out yeah we went out um that deer ran into the food plot hour before dark stopped 25 yards in that sweet spot and started feeding <laughs> literally trotted in there stopped started feeding i was like Holy, like, I was like, barely got the camera on him, you know, and yeah. he's trotting in here. I'm like, here he comes, here he comes. And, um, we were, he had, he busted his main beam off on one side. And we were like, ah, man, he's still really, you know, he's like a 150 class deer and he busted his main beam. And I'm like, dude, you got a tag. It's January late, you know, it's yeah. almost, shoot him, you, shoot know, him. Like, <laughs> you gotta do it, you know, yeah. and, uh, there's this crazy same thing happened this year. Had a buck on cam looked at it was like yep i'm going there and shoot him tomorrow and went in there and came he came to the plot but not the way that i thought he was going to he came he came off the neighbors i'm in a no i'm in a no bait state right yeah Yeah. he came off the neighbors (laughs) and it's it's uh december 30th the field's been picked forever 
and he was in that food plot. And when I cleaned that deer, you could not have put one more kernel of corn into that deer. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Uh, I wonder what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I don't, I'm not going to say the property day, but I'm like, huh. I cannot believe you even came to this food plot, yeah. bro, because you were so stuffed. Like, it was insane. Like, a bag of corn in, inside that deer. Well, that's it was, what it was. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was just that's literally yeah. what it was. <laughs> I'm like, he either he either found where an auger missed, you know, and spilled a bunch on the ground, or he found a, a bait site. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going with option number two. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going with option. I'm just trying to, you know, give the, the benefit of the doubt. But I was blown away that that deer was even coming to that food plot to feed. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Like, yeah, you got yeah, enough yeah. food in you for. Um, but he was probably just wanting something a little more palatable and, and yep. come to that. Yeah. 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 No, I like it. Yeah. Well, Cody, I know that we've been podcasting for some time here and I want to be cautious of your time. And I know you got a lot of kiddos at home and I just want to thank you for coming on again. We do have yes. one final question that Kev will run by you and then we'll probably wrap this one up. Yeah. So the final question is what have you learned from hunting that you can apply to your everyday life? Um, the, the same thing at the beginning, man. Try hard, can't lose. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I like that. I, a lot. That's good. I've been I've been in the gutter of deer hunting, and um, the year that I killed freeze, man, I hunted so hard. I was all over that deer. Everything was going right, and uh, passing deer, and just really upset with myself for the deer that I was passing. Getting later in the year, later in the year, drove to Missouri always smash in missouri during rifle season Mm -hmm. had the worst rifle season missouri i've ever had didn't even see a shooter buck in four days um turned around drove all the way back up here set the first day of gun season all day didn't see a deer (laughs) decided to go back to the same spot sat there till 9 30 still hadn't seen a deer passed a beautiful 135 eight pointer with a bunch of base trash and then killed a 190 inch deer about five minutes later. <laughs> Show! on the, on the literally crazy. worst, the little or worst deer. <laughs> and the year before that I killed a buck, um, October 15th. Um, and then killed a, a buck in November. And the year before that I killed a buck November 7th. And the year after that, I killed a buck October 15th again. And now I'm going into this year thinking, I'm going to slam dunk and I struggle, (laughs) struggle, struggle the whole entire year and cannot win, cannot win. And then, you know, hit a grand slam and, you know, the ninth inning and and kill a world-class deer. So um, forever since that moment in hunting, but I, it's, it's eyes open. When you kill something that you've been watching that long, you're like, I can do this. I can do Mm that. Like I can, I can, I know what I'm doing out here enough that I can do this. I just got to put the work in to make it happen. Yeah. And that's the same thing in life, man. Whatever you want to do, you put enough work in it and you can make it happen. Yeah. Um, no, I like that. Just like me, I non-technologically based. Um, my life is an absolute shit show from morning to end. And I'm able to release a podcast every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central time. Yeah. Somehow, some way. Yeah. I make it happen. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and you just got done with soccer practice, and it's you know it's ten o'clock at night, and you're yeah. out, you're on here podcasting with us bums. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I appreciate it. I don't know when to quit, and my wife tells me that all the time. Yeah, yeah, she's she, good. She said, tells me two things: you need to stick up for yourself more, and you don't know when to quit. I'm like. <laughs> That kind of the oxymoron, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of they cancel but each other you out. You can't yeah. tell. You can't tell them that, you know. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yep, that's that's what I would say, you know. And, and one more thing, shit ain't got to be perfect either. Yeah. Everything, you know. It my, you look at me talk about trail cams on here. It sounds like I got my stuff together and really know what I'm doing, but every single thing that I learned was from messing up mm-hmm. and I wasn't like, Oh, this would be a good idea. I'll do this. Or no, it was, how can I fix? So I don't do this dumb crap next time I go out. Yeah. And that's the same thing with life, man. You, yeah. You're going to, you're going to mess shit up all the way along and, and figure out a way to, to get through it and, and come out better, mm-hmm. you know? And, and everybody's like that, no matter how pretty they look, put together, they look, 
man, if you could see what's behind me in this room right now, you'd be like, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why the camera angle was yeah, playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everything is smoke show, dude. Yeah. Everything is, is everything is uh, <laughs> everything is smoke and mirrors, you know, yeah. with most people. But yep. the internet um, too. Yep. Yeah, like I said, this much on the side of getting it done every time. <laughs> I love that. I feel like my life's the same way. I feel like what? I've lived like that my yeah. whole life too. I, like I agree. Yeah, just this too. close to disaster and God gets us through the other side of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How how are you got how are you so good, man? I'm just that <laughs> that close to not being as good as I am like every yeah. single time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One wrong step and you're over the other yeah. side. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then once you go over that edge, it's it's hard to crawl oh, out. Yeah, it it is. isn't like a it isn't like a foot drop. It's like a fifty foot no. drop. <laughs> it's a dark side over there, yeah, boys. Yeah. It's either <laughs> success or utter disaster. There's no yeah. There's no like man, that was okay. Yeah, that, that's not how my life goes. It's either no. we did it or wow, we were way way off. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you say that because I'm looking back at my life right now and I'm thinking like the same thing. I'm like, man, I have never lived where it was just like just normal yeah it's always I, one extreme lows, it's always lows. one extreme or the other yeah. so far uh, the guy i work with um pretty heavily you know he has kids as well and uh, he said something a few years ago and he said i'm a man at evens he said right when i got something good coming along yeah. i know something <laughs> bad's coming <laughs> Dude, that's like, so I funny. Money saved up, something's about to break. Yeah. Yeah. I need a new dishwasher or something. Yep. It's coming. You know? That's classic. Um, yep. So I was like, yep, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. I'm a man of evens. And I, you know, I think that, um, like I said, by the grace of God, we come out of, you know, shining the way we do. And sometimes I, like, just before we did this podcast, making supper to come up here and get on this show, I look at my wife um, and she's getting the kids clothes for tomorrow. And I, you know, I'm just like, our life is absolutely beautifully crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's just how it is, man. And um, she's super proud of her every, every day, dude. She's, she's kick ass and couldn't do it without her and could not hunt as much as I do mm-hmm. without her and, and stay up late and do podcasts like this. But what you guys don't know is I got home from, uh, from uh, practice um, ate supper real quick with the kids, gave three of them, made sure three of them, I got three boys, so they got a shower every single day. There, you know? <laughs> they all got in the shower, and they have this weird thing where once they get dried off in the shower, they want me to carry them from the shower to whatever room. So I had, <laughs> before I came up here, I'm like, all right, get in the shower. And I go there, I carry one, and I like to, I like to get chucked on the couch. So I chuck one on the couch, <laughs> make another kid get in the shower. He's in there for five minutes, chuck him on the couch. <laughs> and then literally chucked the third kid on the couch, walked up the stairs, and recorded this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah. That's wild. So, Dude, if if that's not like humbling right there that we're just normal guys, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah. we make we everybody makes it work, you know what I mean? Like that I love that story because like from the outside looking in, a lot of people that make content might the viewers might think like, Oh, they got such a perfect life or oh, you know, I wish yeah. that, that was them and it's like dude, we just Yeah. We're just living by the edge of our seats yeah. every day. day, by day. Oh, every day, dude. Yeah. Every day you wake up, you're like Another day, another <laughs> way, and and uh, you know you hear people say it gets faster and faster the older you get, and, and it's it's true. Yeah, and then it's just a you have to relish in the monotony of life, yeah, because that's that's the glory of it. Every day is the glory of I get to go to work. You just got to relish in the, like I said, the mundaneness of the working man's existence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and cherish the kids, cherish the relationships, cherish the friendships like we have, because yep. um, that's what you know gets you through the mundane. Yeah, yeah. Like, yep. Amen. Yeah. No, I like that yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah, I'm with you. Well, Cody, um, we want to thank you for coming on, and why don't you give the listeners um, where your social media is, the podcast, all that information. Yep. Plug yourself. Yeah. Uh, all my socials: uh, Whitetail underscore Legacy Podcast. Um, my socials, I had a co-host. He was very good at social. I'm the complete opposite of that. Um, I'm not very, uh, consistent and I've kind of put it on the back burner. 
Um, I took the decision on this podcast of uh, leave a legacy is what I've always said. Um, I'm committed to do this for 15 or 20 years um, Mm -hmm. and see where it goes. The ultimate lifetime goal would be able to pass this podcast down to one of my kids um, and let them keep keep ripping it. Yeah. Uh, um, And uh, there's there's something really good about for me having something that I have to be consistent on. Um, and this is my thing. Like I have to consistently yeah. release an episode. I have to consistently do it. Um, and it, and it brings me a sense of pride to be able to do it. So every Wednesday when I release an episode at 11 a.m. Central time and it goes up, I'm extremely proud that I made it another week. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as hectic as my life is. So you can find me on all, um, streaming platforms for podcasts. I did, uh, go to waypoint recently as well. Um, and, uh, but that's me in a nutshell, man. I, I'm a, if you want to listen to whitetail, 99% whitetail content with me dibbling and dabbling and about dad stuff in the middle, that's, that's my show. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm extremely, I'm extremely proud of it, man. It's something that I've, um, worked really hard on and, uh, I'm very, I say it on every end of every show. I love you guys. And I love, I love the people that are, are helping me like this year I was able to buy my kid a crossbow off the, the podcast. I was able mm-hmm. to buy him a 350 legend off the podcast, um, to get him set up for hunting. Right. So yeah. it's less money I have to take away from my family. Um, and it gives me a little added incentive to, uh, to keep doing this, you know, doing what I love. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yep. no, appreciate I... you guys have me on and let me chat. This was a mix of uh, of life and of trail cameras, but <laughs> the more I podcast, the more my own content transitions into that. Yeah, of uh, yep. mixing a little bit of life stuff with hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, it's relatable. I think. Yeah, I like to hear it, and uh, I've come to the terms of having less guests on that I think other people want to hear and talking about what I would talk about. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I'm with you on that. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. once again, thanks again for coming on. And if anybody wants to check out his podcast, please do. Yeah, I really, I really enjoy it myself. Yeah. I know, I know we listen to it, so yes. definitely check it out. Give him a follow on Instagram, you know, Facebook, YouTube, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Go check him out. But I say we wrap her up. Kev. Alrighty. All right. Doesn't matter what you've done in the past. You can always be born again, and born again is out. Peace.